Hello, everybody. So my topic is talent development in academia. And this is a topic I have studied, I can't believe it, for, for the last 20 years. But it's still going on. The last publication came out uh, during this year. So it's a topic that's inspiring me. Uh, I'm going to bring the gender issue. Uh, yesterday I decided that maybe this is the time to really bring it up. And then in the end, uh, I'm also going to bring up some pedagogy uh, that would promote uh, uh, creativity and uh, talent development. Uh, this research started uh, already in 1999, like I said, 20 years ago. And it was a research project funded by the Academy of Finland. Academy of Finland is the biggest funder of our research. And the name of the project was Actualizing Finnish Giftedness. And like you can see, the project was funded for eight years. That's very unusual. So the Academy of Finland usually, usually gives you like a four-year funding. But in this case, they gave me another one. So the project went so well that, that I got another four years. And. Uh, the Finnish data for this study included 166 Finnish Olympians in mathematics, physics and chemistry from the years 1965 to 2000. And these Olympians are young people in the secondary school who take part to the International Olympic Games in academic subjects and here mathematic subject. So I am now bringing you the world of uh, mathematics and science. We have heard music and art, and now it's the natural sciences. Um, in this study, I also had the parents of these Olympians, 169 Finnish parents, mothers and fathers. And um, when the, st uh, the study uh, started, the participant Olympians they were between 21 and uh, 40 years old. And this study is part of the international research project. Uh, the other countries are US, Germany, Taiwan and Korea. And the leader of the project is uh, Dr. James Campbell from Jones University, New York. So he's the reason my husband is the first reason I go to New York often, but um, Dr. Campbell is the second reason. Mm -hmm. So we are still uh, cooperating. He's already 82 years old, but he's still writing, he's still active uh, and a creative person. Uh, here you can see the web, web page about this uh, International Olympiad project. And the research question we have uh, studied all these years is, what factors help or hinder the Olympians to actualize their talents. And I already told you the uh, Finnish data. And um, the Finnish participant, they took part to these competitions. Uh, the response rate was 65 to 70%. So a questionnaire was sent to all the Finnish people who have taken part and quite nice response rate. And here you can see the gender issue, only 16 females. So when we are talking about mathematics and science, uh, it's a very male dominated field. And um, we used mixed methods in this study, started with the surveys, questionnaires to Olympians and their parents. And this survey method was very uh, important because we had uh, five more countries. So we wanted to ask exactly the same questions uh, from every country. We also had some open questions so the people could write. And um, in addition, personal interviews with some of the Olympians and telephone interviews with their parents. For the Finnish data, uh, I interviewed 28 Olympians. 
and in these interviews we discussed the childhood, the youth, current life and future plans of these people. Both professional and personal life were discussed. And a special emphasis was on the critical events in talent development. What kind of events do these um, Olympians identify that have been important for their talent development? Interviews lasted one to three hours and they were recorded and uh, transcribed. And like I told you that I used this critical events method uh, they were analyzed, you know, from these interviews and um, the critical events were the experiences that helped the Olympians to identify their talent or to succeed in their career. A content analysis was used to analyze the themes of these critical events and I used another coder, uh, so the interrail reliability was 0.90, so very valid categories. And here you can get an overview what kind of uh, professional lives these Olympians had chosen. Uh, majority of them were researchers in the academia. Uh, 35 and 5 percent at this time. And now we have done longitudinal studies. If you look at the situation now, 50% of the Olympians have a doctoral degree. So majority of them chose a career in uh, academia. Many of them became an engineer or computer specialist or C CEO or manager in the companies. Uh, they were very productive. So if you look what they have done, uh, they had uh, published articles, they had published books, research papers and patents. But if you look, there is a difference between the males and females. This is the Finnish data, but this is a global trend. The males publish books, females publish articles. The males publish patents, but females don't have only two patents by the females. And this is a global trend. For some reasons, females don't uh, publish patents. So what were the contributed factors? Uh, we asked both the Olympians and their parents and compare their answers. And an interesting finding was that the parents rated all the contributing factors. We had like 14 contributed factors. More important to the develop, development of academic talent than the Olympians. So the parents and the children uh, disagreed and also mothers and fathers disagreed. That was an interesting my, uh, finding. So they had a different perspective what happened in their homes. However, uh, the Olympians uh, said with their own words that home atmosphere was very conducive to learning. That was the most important factor in the talent development. We know from the previous research that people in science usually have a very good home environment. If you look at the homes of artists, they have more turbulence background. So sometimes they come from families uh, with the problems, alcohol problems, uh, etc. Good teachers was rated as the second important factor. And then the Olympians said that um, other important things were my active use of library. They loved to read. They were early readers. They learned to read in the age of three or four, many of them. And after that, it was constant reading. Self-discipline. So it's not only talent, it's also discipline. Early learning in mathematics and reading. My own 
inner drive. So these people say that it's not the teacher, it's not the mother, it's not the father, it's me. Uh, so they were very self-directed learners. Uh, they had a huge desire to compete and they hated to lose. What kind of hindrances they identified? Very few. Uh, Olympians mentioned that uh, they were educated in Finland and in the Finnish schools they didn't have enough challenge. So the school was too easy. Courses were thought at too low a level for me. The boys uh, suffered from bullying. So the other children, they were envious of the talented uh, students. And that's also a global trend. 30% of mathematically gifted boys are bullied. The girls are ignored. And they also complained about the Finnish educational system because it has an emphasis on equality. It really meant that they never had enough challenges. We don't have special schools for gifted children, like for example United States has or some other countries. Finland, uh, it's inclusive education, so none of these kids had attended any special schools. And now let's go to the qualitative data, which is, uh, I'm here highlighting the gender perspective. And I have chosen here uh, case studies of six female Olympians of different ages. And I used the methodology that every female I chose was chosen a male Olympian from the data that represented the same age group and professional orientation than the female. So if it was like a 30-year-old female in mathematics, I chose a 30-year-old male in mathematics. And this way uh, I could compare uh, any differences or similarities, uh, what is the effect of uh, gender. And uh, again, interviews, one to two hour interviews, and then uh, discussion of these um, life histories. And I also collected curriculum vitae, just to check the validity. People don't always remember right. So when you have the curriculum vitae, you can at least um, check some of these uh, uh, instances they are talking about. All these people have uh, given a permission to use their real name. And here you can see the females. Uh, some of them are in their 20s, some of them are 30s, 50s, uh, and you can see they represent different fields. Physics, mathematics, medicine. Um, here you can see the males who, who are paired, you know, with the females. For example, Matti, who is uh, 54 in mathematics, for spare with the Kaisa who was same age and in the same field. If you look at these tables, you can see that the males have more publications. And um, at this stage, uh, males have reached status in the academia. So you can see two full professors. If you look at the data now, we have more professors because some of these Olympians were very young. Um, and let's go to the critical events. Let's start with the childhood. What kinds or kind of events they remembered from their childhood? And you can see that males have more critical events in childhood than uh, females. For the males, it's uh, 18, and for the females, only six. Uh, all the males identified reading experiences. So the parents gave them books, they were early readers, uh, and you can see that only two females mentioned these reading experiences. Mathematics experiences, very common to all the males. Some of them said that they loved the numbers, so they saw the world through the numbers. Whatever they did, they counted. 
uh, science experiments, uh, more for ma males than females. So the parents were active and they um, brought science experiences and mathematics experiences for their sons, but not that much for their daughters. So the daughters, they went to the piano lessons and they were guided to art in a different way than the boys. Parents also discussed more with the boys than with the girls. Now we come to the school, and you, you can see that more equality. When the children went to school, uh, females started to have more uh, critical events. Academic competitions, you can see, they all had them, and it was so important. Sometimes there is a discussion, is competition bad? Here in Finland, you know, uh, we have this kind of a discussion that it's not good to compete, you, you should just cooperate. But uh, in light of this data, these people, they love to compete. And this competition was also a social event. That's where they cut their friends. Similar uh, kind of uh, talented people who were interested in the same issues. So very important. Teachers' encouragement was more important for the females than males, like you can see. Um, one female from my data told me that, uh, my teacher told me that you're going to have a PhD in mathematics. And she did. So it was kind of like self-fulfilling prophecy, what happened. For the males, peer support was more important. Uh, boys who were uh, talented in mathematics, they wanted to play chess together, they wanted to do math together, uh, and also hobbies were more important uh, than for the girls, and those hobbies were something that uh, helped them to uh, develop their talents. Now we come to college, and you can see that more equality, uh, very important event was studies abroad. You can't be the talent in your field without some international experiences. And that was true with these Olympians as well. Uh, choosing the right domain. Uh, this population, they were very good students, so they were not only good, good in math and sciences, they also played piano, they were good in everything. So they were usually the best students in their school. Uh, however, uh, they said that it was so important to choose the right domain. Um, one of them had taken part to three Olympian Games in mathematics, in physics, and in chemistry. And um, usually the right domain was computer science. So if you were in mathematics, you should, uh, those who chose computer science, their talent development was, uh, they had more chances to actualize it. Mentor support, some of them had it. Uh, here you can see that uh, two females and one male mentioned it. Events in childhood. Again, males have more events. International cooperation, very important to both males and females. Males mentored the youth, the future Olympians. Two of these six males started to educate the future generation. And then an important uh, choice was the choice of a partner. Um, for the males, they said that they took a partner who took care of everything else so that they could concentrate on their important career. For the females, it was the opposite. The females said they either had a partner who was also in the academia, so somebody who supported the female career, or they were alone. So that was the choice of a, for a female. And now I'm give, uh, giving you uh, an example of one of these females. This kind of like opens up the life of a female uh, scientist. Her name is Kaisa. Kaisa is today 70 years old and she is um, Professor Emerita in Aalto University. And I would say that she is the most famous uh, Finnish female mathematics. 
and her special uh, area is Krup, uh, talo, uh, Krup Talochi. How do you pronounce this? Yes, thank you. Cryptology, yes. It's a field of applied mathematics, um, deals with computer science, uh, securing data, you know, with codes. So she really found, you know, the right field. And she was one of the eight students who participated in the 1965 to Mathematical Olympiad. That was the first Olympiad, and, and Finland had a team, eight uh, students, four females, four males, and Kaisa was one of them. And Kaisa has been studied first time in 1999, she answered the questionnaire, then she was interviewed in 2000, and then again 2014. Like I said, that we are doing longitudinal studies follow-up. And if you look at her profile, she has a very male profile. Her first job was in the Finnish Defense Forces in Army and in Nokia, the biggest information technology company in Finland. Um, in 1997, Kaiser was appointed adjunct professor and in 2005, full professor at the Helsinki University of Technology, today Aalto University. So she changed her career from the company to academia. You can see that Kaiser has uh, many publications. As a female, she is exceptional. She has 12 patents and nine pending. Uh, eight doctoral or licentiate thesis supervised, and um, she has received uh, funding, you know, from the prestigious Academy of Finland at Matin and supervised students. If you look at her CV, Kaisa sent me the CV, every time it was updated, and you can see that she has many honors in her CV and positions of trust in Finland and abroad. And um, Kaisa is a female that can be used as a model for younger gifted females in mathematics and science. I also wanted to identify <clears throat> what factors uh, in talent development are gender specific and what are gender invariant. Um, and some things like you saw were similar, like all these Olympiads were good students, early readers, good home environment, wanted to compete very self-directed learners. But there was something that was very specific for the females that I need to emphasize. The females really needed goal and task orientation. They really had to get international experience and networking. It was more important for females than males. They really had the need to focus on their careers in order to achieve success. Kaisa has three children, so she's also a mother. Did you know that the mothers of three publish more than mothers of one? So I think this is an interesting finding, yes. Who knows, maybe they really need this goal and task orientation to run so many things. Also, these females, they had expectations that were neither too low nor too high, but realistic and related to their academic success. So they knew what they wanted. Also, females had to have a strong measure of resilience and self-efficacy. And they had to understand defeat as providing an opportunity for learning. Kaisa had some defeats. She had uh, incidents when uh, her male colleagues had told her, you don't have future in mathematics. Can you believe it? That's what she was told, but uh, she didn't give up. So what are the pedagogical implications? 
I promised to uh, mention something about the pedagogy. Teachers and mentors' role in encouraging girls to science is, is crucial all over the world. We know that gifted girls, uh, if they choose career in science, they go to medicine or they go to biology. But uh, computer science, mathematics, physics, uh, we don't have as many uh, gifted females. Choosing the right field, studies abroad, the girls need guidance in that. International cooperation, you can't be famous without it. Uh, the right choice of a partner, we need marriage counseling or dating counseling, what kind of uh, man these girls should marry if they want to have a partner. Or and then I'm coming to what I'm doing here at the Collegium. My process is about changing mindsets in learning, and I'm talking about the growth mindset in learning. And, um, and this is uh, something uh, I'm trying to build. And I think it's important for low achieving students, but also for these high achieving students. Uh, here is a recent publication. Uh, it's already, it's open access publication, but it's coming 2019, January, it's coming out in the Journal of Teaching and Teacher Education. I've published it with my research group and uh, it's called In Search of a Growth Mindset Pedagogy. And this is a case study of one teacher's classroom practices in a Finnish elementary school. We are showing what kind of pedagogical practices the teacher is doing. This was stimula stimulated recall met methodology. So we also videotaped like Keith and, and uh, analyzed you know, the video and interviewed the teacher. And um, if I just say a few points about this growth mindset pedagogy. Uh, this growth mindset comes from Carol Dweck from Stanford. Growth mindset means that you believe in effort. You believe that nobody is born smart, nobody is born stupid with the effort and uh, you can achieve almost anything. A fixed mindset believes, for example, that girls can't learn mathematics. And believe me, today this belief is still valid here in Finland. And, um, and we are making interventions, you know, in the elementary grades. Uh, uh, and, and mathematics and music are two subjects that people think that I'm not born with musical talent or, or I'm not born with a, a mathematical talent. And um, according to growth mindset, it's not like that. You can learn if you practice. And one key issue in this growth mindset pedagogy is the power of not yet. So this means that we need to keep the high expectations. If we want to have future Kaisas, you know, in Finland, you know, talented female in mathematics, we need to keep the high standards and we, we need to guide these girls, you know, uh, if they fail, we need to give room for making mistakes. I believe that no creative work can be done without making mistakes, without failing. And that's the idea in growth mindset pedagogy. Let's give room, you know, for mistakes. And if you make a mistake, give support and say, not yet, you need to try harder. Kaisa made many mistakes before she became world known. And I think this is something we should uh, encourage uh, both boys and girls or those who don't want to identify their gender. Okay, thank you. Yes. For example, we asked who has been the most important person in your talent development. Uh, the uh, Olympian said me, myself. The mother say that the father, and the father, father, father say that the mother. 
isn't that interesting? In the same uh, home environment, you can have a different perspective. Then we made some cross-cultural uh, comparison. Uh, Asian students say, my teacher or my parent. They never say myself. So this is a cultural issue. Uh, Finland, we are a very individualistic country, actually, and uh, people are very individualistic, and they only want to give credit to themselves. So some of them said, I'm a self-made man. They didn't want to give credit to anybody else. But ask an Asian person, they would praise their parents, they would praise their teachers. Hmm, actually yes, that, that was one of the things uh, we asked. Uh, some, of, some of them did, because um, uh, like I said, that the families were good families and, and some of the families were like academic families. So the children followed uh, their parents abroad and of course that was uh, an advantage. One interesting f finding from Finland, which is different from any other country, uh, no, uh, others be, other people can't believe it. In Finland, mothers had uh, higher income than fathers. This was the only country, you know, in, in this study that mothers, they were usually teachers of mathematics. And, and teachers of mathematics, they probably make quite nice money, you know, if they are teaching in the secondary school. Um, so many of these Olympians, they had a, their mother was a teacher. Can you specify one thing? I remember this from your last talk, sorry for stepping. Yes. You just said that mothers of mathematics makes good money. But if I'm correct, wrong, right, correctly from last year, one of your talks also said that the reason why uh, education has been so good comparatively mm. in Finland yes. is because it's very difficult to get into the program. Uh -huh. And you, you were saying that yes. the Zardas in the medicine and in the, they actually make the money. Can you tell us two things about this? Because people do not know that. Okay. It's only very surprising. Yeah, that is surprising. Say yeah. these two things in uh, your... I mean, this, to get into an, an education it program, it the grades need to be as good as... Uh, you were saying almost medicine. Or That's care. right. So if you want to get to the elementary school teacher education program, yeah. you know, we only take like le less than 10%. Uh, and if you look at the medicine and, and law, it's more than 10%. So it's more difficult to get into the elementary school teacher program to the med uh, than to medicine and, and law. Mm. Yeah. And the pay is Okay. Pay is okay. It's the same, you know. I I, I think you know. At, at least the secondary school teachers make the same money than the lawyers and doctors. So. No. Uh, well, I know. Uh, I have two daughters. The other one is a medical doctor. The other one is a lawyer. So I know the salaries. Believe me. <laughs> I know. I do. I educate teachers. I do know. Yes, being a, the, the, the bit, being a teacher of mathematics subject, you can have like extra hours, you know, it's like a different thing than being maybe a teacher of, I'm not talking about elementary uh, teachers or kindergarten teachers, but secondary level teacher of mathematics subject, they probably make the best money. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Perhaps they may, but they remember that you were talking about uh, uh, retrospectively articulated data. Did they do that in the 1960s, 70s, 80s? Uh, I doubt it. Mm, maybe. Maybe. But, well, my father used to be a, a teacher in mathematics in Lukio. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. And, and he told that he got every profit he could. And he kind of praised it for being such a good man that he got such a good salary. And he actually he got better pension than me when I was uh, uh, my 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 very good uh, job at the at the university, uh, the Spillers Academy, mm -hmm. uh, as a, uh, and it was just according to my 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 master's degree, and, and of course the mathematics uh, teacher has a master's degree, you know, not, mm -hmm. not more. And there is a lack of mathematics teachers. We have lack of STEM teachers, so. We really need need them more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it, it, it's interesting that, that, that the, 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 they didn't mention the Olympians didn't mention the teachers because uh, 
this, this um, percentage that you take in mm -hmm. into the, the, the colleague, mm -hmm. colleague uh, it's, it's such a, you know, people value the teaching, though, but they, you know, and, and yeah. not the only thing. Well, they did. They, they, the uh, good teachers was the second rated item, you know, like when they rated home atmosphere was the first one. Second teacher, good teachers, but still they think that it's me. I, I was the one who learned everything by myself, so. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you for the question, yes. Um, we also asked them, this is actually related to this growth mindset I'm now interested, we asked about the attributions, you know, that do they think that it's their inner ability or is it their effort uh, that makes them, you know, to succeed. Uh, Germans said that it's my inner ability, uh, Americans said it's my effort, and Finnish said it's both. So he, even here we we could see like very clear you know like cultural differences. So the Finland are the self-made men, self-made women. They are not mentored. They didn't go to special schools. Um, they th think that it was their ability, but also the effort and the self-discipline that made them to success. Um, what else? And they were usually the firstborn children of their families. That, that was typical of the, of the Finnish date. From big academic families, they could have like five, five children and the Olympian was the firstborn. That was like the typical family structure. Okay. Uh, it is. I, I know. I know. I didn't. I didn't look that. It's still possible to take a look, but I didn't take a look at that. Yeah. Okay. Then, uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.